As part of our wildlife series, I'm very happy to be with Mike Bromwich, um, a former warden at Man Camp in, in Wanky, and a, and, a, and a stalwart of uh, the Rhodesian and then the Zimbabwe Game Department. Mike uh, produced this excellent book, um, which covers the history of, of the department, and I found it absolutely fascinating. Mike, I look at it. So often, uh, and I always find something new to read. Um, and so that was a hell of a fine effort you made there. But um, Mike, just what I want to say by, by way of introduction is, um, you know, the story of the Rhodesian Game Department, to my mind, is more than a, a story about conservation. It's another great story about um, people of different races, particularly black and white, coming together in a joint endeavor and just showing what can be done with very limited resources when people are well-managed, motivated, and committed to a cause. And I think that's, that's what underlies the, the story of, of the game department. And it's the reason why so much um, was done um, with so little. Um, and you know, in this regard, I think a shining example of human endeavor um, in the world of conservation is the, the story of Wanky National Park, um, which we'll come to. But before we get to that, I just want to ask you to talk us through just a brief history of the, of the uh, National Parks and Wildlife, the Game Department, how it started and the early years. Good afternoon to you, uh, Hannes. Thanks very much. Um, if we go back in time, and people don't, don't really realize that, you know, the department as we know only came in, that's the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management only came into, into being in, in 1963. And it's that department that, um, that really should, uh, really shone and brought Rhodesia, Zimbabwe um, into the limelight in the conservation world and introduces some very, very progressive management policies. Um, and, produced some legendary, and I mean legendary, um, game wardens, uh, people strong in the field of capture, uh, research officers, and uh, legendary trackers, the Bushmen, obviously, and then the, there were the Shangans, and there were the Mashonas, there was an incredible bunch of, of people. So, but if we, if we go back, we look at that, and we go back before, let's say, before, the, in the early days, wanky, was our, basically our first park. And I think we've got to you know, start our, our, our journey uh, looking at, at Wanky, at, at, at uh, the people that pioneered Wanky, Ted Davidson, Bruce Austin, um, John Tebbett. There were others like Tim Braybrook, Harry Cantrell, um, Ron Thompson, Jordi Jordan. There was also James Verney, who we know very little about. His career in 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 national parks or wanky as it was because there was no national park in those days it was a game reserve and we'll go back to when it started it's very very limited but we'll talk about him in a moment so good to go back in 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 in, uh, in time you would go back to 1926 when major bogey who was a member of the uh colonies legislative assembly the first legislative assembly in uh, the colony uh, he put a motion forward in 1926 that uh, the House take note of the urgent need to establish a game, uh, a game reserve. Now, Major Bogey and our people who know Gwela, which is Gweru, will recall that there 
was a statue in, in, the, in the middle of town, you know, of Major Bogey um, was put up in remembrance of him. And his wife, I recall, was alive when I was in, in Kweru uh, in 1964. She was a fiery old lady, and, uh, but she was still alive in 1964. And so if we just look back to, the, to those days, um, the House did take note of it. They took note of Colonel Bogey's other remarks that wildlife was one of Rhodesia's or Zimbabwe's greatest assets. These were very... Um, very sort of profound words in those days and the words that have, have you know have very prophetic they've proved uh, to be true and the wildlife in this country has developed the tourist industries uh both consumptive and non-consumptive which we'll deal with maybe in other programs but the tourist industry they've it's brought our parks into being our magnificent parks and wanky uh being being the showcase of the department it brought brought the park into being so if we go back um, in time, we go back to 1926 and move forward a couple of years. Uh, Wanky was declared in late 1928 as a game reserve, it came into being. And Ted Davidson was appointed the, the first game warden. Now, what we know about Ted in those days is that if he was born in, in Hati or Chukutu, as it is now known, and I think it was, I think it was to, uh, 1908, I think it was, um, but thereabouts. Uh, his, on the death of his mother, his family returned to, to Britain, which was around about 1921, where he completed his senior school. And then shortly afterwards, he, he came flying back, wouldn't say flying on, I mean, he made a hasty turn to, to Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, uh, to the country that he loved and he'd grown up in. He, his early career, we know a limited amount about. He was apprentice to a taxidermist. He did some farming in uh, the Sonoya or the Chinoy area. And uh, then joined the veterinary department as a Tetsi control officer and was posted to, into the Doma area in the, in, the, in the north. Fairly rugged area in those days, but was devoid of elephant and stuff like that. It was from there that um, Ted moved to, 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 to Wanky. Um, we know that there was an advertisement put out for for the job of post of Warden Wanky. We know there was at least one other application. We just don't know too much about the interviewing board or the criteria that they looked at. You know, one must realize that Wanky had been uh, proclaimed a, a game reserve. There were beacon points. The interior of the park was completely unknown. It was reported to be a, a, a great wildlife area. The board reports from hunters um, were phenomenal. I mean, there were buffalo being shot, Giraffe are being shot and all sorts of things, but nothing else was known about the park. So we just don't quite know what, um, what the criteria the, the uh, interviewing board sort of um, had in mind when they, they interviewed uh, Ted Davison, but obviously they, they found the qualities in, in the man that they were looking for, obviously very dedicated. Uh, he had, uh, they saw vision in him, uh, they saw passion, uh, they saw all the qualities, obviously, they were looking for, and Ted was appointed. We know that he travelled by rail to to Det, and uh, they disembarked and made his way, whatever. But from there, uh, not quite sure how he settled or where, but he must have settled quietly, made a in that debt in that debt area. We do know in the, in that one of his primary tasks, or his primary task, was to to explore and to map, to, to map when people, without having a map, not, and exploring, you wouldn't know anything about the park, and you actually can't manage anything or develop any uh, uh, a state or vast piece of land without knowing the boundaries, not knowing what was in the rivers. Um, it was, it was a very, very hostile country. It was hostile. And Ted uh, covered that the early days, covered the park on foot and horseback, company with by mules and uh, pack animals and donkeys. Uh, he patrolled uh, with the aid of the Bushmen that they recruited. Uh, they came, most of them from the Makona area. They were obviously moving through the park from time to time as they did, but they came from the Makona area and Ted, Ted recruited them. And, and these, 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 these naturalists, magnificent naturalists guided uh, Ted, you know, across the park in the, in the the wet weather, it would have been fairly simple. Uh, they went from pan to pan, from watercourse to watercourse. 
it was it was fairly easy. Um, for the dry season, it would have been from seep to seep, from permanent water point to permanent water point. And the water was scarce, so it would have been it would have been very very hard for Ted. Um, he would have taken you know copious made copious notes. He would have done a lot of sketching. Uh, they worked with compasses, and I don't think we just really you know with all the mod cons that we've got today, we've got the GPSs and uh, and stuff like that. We actually realised how accurate and how detailed and how finite Ted's work must have been for him to, in future years, lay out the roads, lay out water points and plan water points and roads, tourist roads, all related back to his early exploration days in, in Wanky. It's a phenomenal amount of work that he did. And if we move forward in, a little bit in time, and I think it was 1932, uh, he married Connie or Constance. They established home. Um, in what is what Ted now named uh, under an you know, old abandoned farm farmhouse, um, just off the dead flay, in which Ted now named Main Camp. It was a deserted farmhouse with huge, a uh, huge camel thorn trees. Um, the garden, these trees, and the sort of legend has it that these are the trees that uh, Frederick Salou had um, camped under many, many years before, decades before. They were huge, and so they, they expanded the, you know, just covered the lawn and the gardens. And if I just go back in a little bit of time, and, uh, you know, I've made a lot of notes about this. When I was warden in 1982, 83 in, 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 um, in Main Camp. I lived in the same house as Ted. It obviously had been modified a little bit. Uh, the huge, you know, verandas were there, and the, the two, um, two giant trees were there, these, these magnificent monuments to nature, still adorned the garden. What's happened since then, I'm not quite sure, but look, they may be there. That we've had some very, very severe droughts. That's 40 years ago, over 40 years ago. And they may be there. I would like to think they are, but we know they just may not be. Um, so that was that was the main camp that uh, we know today, that the warden's house was still standing. They're still standing today, I understand. It may have changed a bit. Ted um, established that camp. Other rangers came in, came to work with him. We know of James, James Fernie, who joined, I think it was... 1935, he was nicknamed Boswangwan by his staff. What, uh, he was tall, obviously, very lanky. We don't, you know, we, we, history doesn't tell us or records don't show us what he exactly did, but he would have obviously patrolled, done a lot of horse patrols, foot patrols with Ted and by himself exploring and also making notes and uh, documenting wildlife. He unfortunately was killed in 1943, I think it is. Um, in the Second World War, as far as I recall, he was with the with the Air Force when he was killed. Um, and there is a, remo a memorial plaque to him in the regional offices in in Hawaii. Mike, so that's a brief a brief outline on that. Mike, just um, if I can interrupt there, um, am I right in saying that there is no well, there was no permanent water in in the park, uh, and so the key to unlocking the potential of the park was really the establishment of permanent water points. Uh, I think you're correct. You know, there are a few seeps um, in the Robbins area. There are some seeps up there. There are one or two other seeps. I think, you know, in time, some of the permanent water has, has disappeared, um, you know, with the changing climate. But basically, you, you're 100%. You know, the Bushmen did know of the, of the odd permanent water supply, the, the seeps. And uh, they moved, you know, when they moved across, frankly, when they hunted in that area, or they gathering, gathering the sort of the pitchels there, they knew, the, they knew the, the, the permanent water points. But as you're quite right in saying, the Greater Wanky Park uh, has been established around game water, water, water points. And Ted was responsible for putting a lot of those in. Um, the early ones, certainly, Yamasoba ones and a few others. They were the first ones to be put in, and uh, it was just it was remembered that his foresight and that he was developing the park. Um, you know, he, he looked ahead. Tourism, he realised that um, there would be need to disperse game. That that you couldn't you couldn't disperse game uh, without water points. The stuff would would, would move out and migrate, um, and stuff like that. So yeah, you're quite right when you say that, Hannes. That um, Permanent water points were the key key to Wanky, and and uh, you know there, there's many many permanent water points across the um, the park as today. Mike, um, another another 
point I want to make about um, Ted Davidson, which I find very interesting in light of where we find ourselves today with um, a world constantly outraged when um, predators, particularly lions, are shot by hunters. Um, Ted Davidson very early on realized that too many predators would present a problem for expanding other species of game. Um, and he advocated the um, controlled elimination of, of some predators. Is that, is that not correct? That's perfectly correct. Um, yes, Ted did introduce his policy, lion, leopard, wild dog, and hyena. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were eliminated as and when seen. Now, look, it is, it is a very, very controversial policy, particularly today. I mean, it's completely unthought. Or it is, it, it, uh, people's hair, would, or probably they probably stand on end as we talk about it now. What the Dickens were thinking about, but Ted realized that, and there were a lot of predators, particularly hyena in the park in those days. There were a lot of wild dogs too. Lion were common. Uh, leopards, you know, were, were everywhere as they, are, as they are. And to establish the, you know, the, the number, just to build up your plains game, your zebra, your um, kudu, eland, uh, wildebeest and stuff like that. The predators had to be eliminated. They had to be, they had to be reduced. Um, and one, we, what, what, I think we've got to look at this uh, sympathetically in the context of yesteryear, and, and I say this in all sincerity, as distasteful as it might seem today, um, it was deemed necessary in the development of the park to reduce the predators. Now we know with, with predators, and, I, and I'm 100% I, sure that um, Ted would have been aware of this too, that your predators bounce back, they bounce back, if there is sufficient food and the habitat is correct. Well, as the game populations expanded and uh, grew, and we can say thank you to, to Ted for this, that we can see, let's say, eland, sable, and sable are very delicate species. Roan, another, another delicate species, uh, wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, uh, impala, kudu, um, scattered across the park, um, bears, bears um, witness to, to, you know, to Ted's policy. Um, that at the time it was correct. It, it was correct at the time. Um, today people frown. A lion, you know, a lion is shot outside the park. People frown. Um, but in those days, it, it was deemed necessary. And I think when you've got to look at it in that context and understand uh, the objectives of the of our early conservationists, what they were looking at, and what they were trying to do. Um, it would have been a very hard decision. It would have, nobody wants to. Well, nobody wants to do that. And it would have been a very hard decision to make, but it was one that was deemed necessary. Let me ask you a very, very difficult question quickly. Um, in those, in Ted Davidson's time in the 30s, roughly how many elephant do you estimate were in the park then? And uh, how many are in the park today? Oh, Hannes, funny you, you, you say that. Uh... Years back when I was warden in Wanky and I had this discussion with, with Dave Cumming, our chief research officer. And I was, I was querying uh, management exercises and he said to me, let's just say that in Ted Davidson's days, there was a thousand elephant. Okay, and then we, 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 we went from there and we sort of, we, we sort of calculated, calculated elephant. So that was, that was his assumption that the estimate would have been a thousand, maybe a few more elephant. Um, but that, that's what Dave, that's the figures that Dave Cumming gave to me uh, years ago. You know, there was obviously an error factor into it, but let's just work on around about a thousand. Today, 40,000, 50,000 elephant in, in Wanky. But what is interesting to note is that, and I remember Ron Thompson speaking to me about this and saying in, in the 60s, Ron was there in main camp with Ted. They were talking about the park carrying capacity at being 2,000. That, that that would be sufficient. Now, now, when we look at what we've got today, you know, 40,000, 50,000 elephant, its park is actually grossly, grossly um, overpopulated with elephant. Basil Williamson, years back when Basil was alive, uh, did a survey in the bottom end of the park down 
down in the Ilangamo, Ilangamo area. I think there were 28 species of trees or 30 species of trees that he sort of marked on. I think it was Mark Butcher, several years later, went down there and this whole lot had gone. The whole lot had been taken out. So these species of trees that were there when Basil was, was our, one of our research officers in the, in the 70s, they had gone in the 1990s or early 2000s, they had disappeared. And that's because of the overpopulation of elephant. And I think one must realize today that certain species have declined. Certain species of animals have declined and bird species have declined. And it's only, only because of habitat destruction by a gross population of elephant. And it's sad to say that. Wakey is not an elephant park. It's a national park. And we, it is a custodian's job to, to look after every species from a dung beetle upwards to the elephant and from the stalks down to the little little babblers and stuff like that. That is what the task is, and the vegetation. Without our vegetation, we'll have nothing. And Wanky, if we go into some of those areas on the bottom end of the park and uh, we see the devastation, it's actually, it's, it's actually frightening. So yeah, that, uh, you know, to, to, that's, you asked the question and uh, I'll try to answer it as, as truthfully as possible. Mike, let's, um, let's go back to the personalities. After Ted Davidson came John Tebbett, another fascinating guy uh, who also got an awful lot of work done. John Tebbett, yeah. <laughs> or JC, as you, you know, as, as he was sort of uh, affectionately known, known by him. Nobody ever called, you know, spoke to him, you know, it was behind his back, it was referred to, to JC, John Charles Tebbett. Seconded from the BSAP, uh, I think he ran about 45, 46 to Wanky. Uh, we don't know whether he volunteered to come or whether the, he was the police sort of, you know, seconded him. They, they, they would have given him an option to go, whatever, whatever it was, uh, John came across. And really, he came across from the mounted unit in, uh, in the BSAP and joined Ted uh, in the roundabout 46. I have seen his diaries. I've seen John's diaries. Um, Trish, his daughter, has got them in South Africa. We were talking about them the other day, and she's still trying to locate some of them. But I remember reading through them years ago. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. There's a lot of work, a lot of horse patrols. Uh, you know, as I say, he was an, he was an ardent horseman. Um, he knew how to handle horses. He knew how to care for horses and, and animals. And he must have got a tremendous amount of pleasure out of, out of you know, extended horse patrols and uh, working with the, with the beasts that, and the animals that he loved. And he, he journeyed, he did six-week horse patrols. He journeyed, traveled up to, up to Robin's camp. He, he, wanted all, he patrolled all over the park with horses and mules. And uh, you know, John, John was an accomplished field man. You know, it's, it's, what is so strange, he, he was always so immaculately turned out. And so many of us only knew John um, when he was regional warden uh, or provincial warden or chief warden. And you know, John never spoke about his never spoke about his field, but he'd done elephant control, lion control. He built fences. He'd done buildings. He built roads. Uh, he'd done the whole lot. He'd done the whole lot, you know. But John just didn't talk about it. He didn't. There was no need for him to talk about it. Um, as I say, he was widely, widely experienced. John's knowledge, um, wanky, was 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 superb. Um, as I say, he he loved his horse patrols and he he enjoyed the the Robins area. He moved up and down there fairly frequently, and he was posted up there to Nantwich. Uh, it must have been in the early early fifties, not the you know, Nantwich area, which just next to Robins, uh, where the Nantwich camp was built, and he was there for a while. Uh, with his young, I mean, I spoke to, to Trish about this as well. But Scratch was his was his son. Scratch also joined the department. Um, unfortunately, Scratch is no longer with us either. Uh, and from there, they John went to, went to Victoria Falls. But we don't say we don't know too much what else you know what else John did in in, in Wanky, But as I say, he was a very very accomplished field man. Sorry, sorry. Uh, John formed the rescue unit in the falls, which went on uh, to do some amazing, perform some amazing tasks. Um, do you do you remember what they got up to that rescue unit? Um, Hannes, yes. Um, when John went went up to the falls um, in the early fifties, one must remember that the, the town was 
and I would say it was, it was a village. Um, the village was in, in the national park. Uh, the whole place, the village, the police station, the box office, the race camp, the shops, everything was in, in was, was the was in the national park. John was basically it's this 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 card discard the police for a second. They were the law enforcement agency. Uh, but John was basically the sheriff. John was really like the sheriff there. And uh, I don't know if I can call that, you know, coin that way. I mean, he was responsible for everything. He really was. And you know, John was was a very responsible man and a caring man. And uh, when we looked, you look at, um, and I, I've sent you a photograph of um, a brochure from Victoria Falls Hotel dating back to 1914. Um, and there, boating was, you know, boating was a facility that was offered by Victoria Falls Hotel to their to the, to the guests. There was boating, there was canoeing um, and stuff like that. Look, there were accidents. And uh, the earliest one, I, I can't remember exactly, but it would. It was, it was 20, I mean, 26, no, no, was it? No, I'm just trying to think when it was. It might have been 26. Anyway, a couple of people were drowned in a boating accident. So John formed, formed the rescue unit, which comprised basically just of park staff. For one daring rescue that he did, he got awarded the MBE when there was complete, uh, he had complete disregard for his own safety. Him and a Dr. Dunn went across to, they were called across to the to the Northern region or the Zambian side. Eastern Cataract where a gentleman, I think it was Mr. Perry had um, fallen over, fallen over the, uh, over the cataract. He, he was, he was, he was, he was, they sort of sightseeing with a couple of ladies in the evening, dark, and uh, they were evidently spoken to him. My notes refer that, you know, sort of reveal that when when the police or, or John was sort of talking to them, said, "Well, what happened?" They said, "Well, he was there one moment, and the next minute we looked again and he was gone." They reported it, and somebody sort of kept watch over uh, over the over the area at night. I'm not sure whether they heard any 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 calls for help. I, I can't remember that, but. In the morning, uh, John was um, John was summoned, and with the, the trooper, BSAP trooper, they went across to the Zambian side, and uh, with their rescue equipment, stretchers, ropes, uh, a cage, a rescue cage, they clambered down, and it was it 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 was a it was under very very perilous circumstances that, that they scrambled down. They found um, Mr. Perry, who was in a lot of pain and uh, fairly badly injured. Wedged, and they managed to get him into the into the rescue cage and hoisted up to to the top. And for that, John Doctor Doctor Dunn was awarded the George Cross, and John Tebbit the Queen's Birthday. It's a photo of a, it was Queen's Birthday um, awards. John got awarded the MBE. It was a it was a very very gallant. Effort. And look, he did several of these. I mean, Tim Braybrook spoke to me very frequently of the of, of the gorge rescues going down uh, into the gorges. And even right down into, into the boiling pot at the bottom to recover bodies. I want us to remember that they had to get the bodies out. They had to, had to recover people. Uh, couldn't issue death certificates. And there was these chaps that some, you know, just put their lives on a line uh, for others. And you now we can only, we, I can only salute uh, John Tebbit, Tom Braybrook, John Hatton, and the others that walked at work, you know, in that, those early days with the rescue. It was it just, there's just something that, John needed to be needed to be done. Uh, he needed to have a unit in place to 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 look after the people. Should anything go wrong with boating on the river and stuff like that, you know, people are irresponsible. And one must think that in those days there were no fences around uh, in the rainforest, the gorges where there was no fences. People walked where they wanted to, and uh, one step too close onto a slippery rock, and over you went. And that that's a tragedy. So yeah, John was you know John was a, just a, a very caring and a very very responsible person, a very community minded. So we give him you know we give him credit to that. So that that that's the early start of the of, of the of the Gorge Rescue Unit, which later the I think the BSAP took it over when in 1971. I think I'm correct. It was 1971. At that stage, the village town itself had been annexed out of the park. It was it, there was a town council in place, so the actual town itself had been annexed out of the park, and so the BSAP um, then then took responsibility for, for the Gorge Unit Parks were, were, were involved. We still, you know, we still sort of the, the main role players, but it, it fell under the responsibility of the, of the BSAP. Mike, they got involved, um, but it was the rescue unit that got involved, um, I think in 73, uh, there were some Canadian girls 
uh, tourists who were gunned down by Zambian army. Um, and it was the rescue unit involving some of the National Park guys who went um, to, their, to their aid. Hannes, yes, if I can just look, you could be, look at the, um, look at my notes quickly on that. Uh, we're talking about the Crowthers, Americans, yeah. John and his wife. Yeah, two Canadian. And, and yes. Marion Driver. Yes, that's and right. And Christine Sinclair. Yes. The, the two girls were Canadians, and uh, the drivers were the sort of the, sorry, the Crowthers were, were Americans. Innocently, they went for a walk down to the gorges. As I recall, the, the girls went, went further ahead than, than, than the Crowthers. The Zambian army was guarding, I think, the little power station across, across the river. They opened fire, ill-disciplined troops opened fire. Crowthers were wounded. And, uh, we'll, and we didn't know at that stage, nobody knew at that stage what the story was with the, with the two, two Canadian girls. At night, as a report came out that people were missing, they'd gone down into the gorges. The John Hatton was, John Hatton was called. Johnny Johnson at that stage was in charge of the, he was the, he was an inspector in the police and he was stationed at, at, in Wanky, but he was still in charge of the gorge rescue unit. Johnny was called and made his way to, to, the, to the falls. Peter Mitchell was called to assist. He was arranged in Victoria Falls. He was called to assist um, John Hatton. They were told of, of the gunfire, that the gunfire, um, you know, the, of the gunfire that had been heard and reported. And you look, know, everybody went down there in a lot of trepidation. John Tebbit, sorry, John um, Hatton and Peter Mitchell went down. They found the Crowthers. At 10.30 at the night, these chaps went down into the gorgeous now, you know, and it, it, was, it was moonlight. Look, they were very, very wary of being shot at again. So they waited for the moon to wane slightly and they went in and they managed, they found, they found the Crowthers and um, Mr. Crowther had been shot and wounded in the thigh. Carol, his wife, uh, was um, uninjured. Oh, they were okay. So the rescue sort of team managed to get down there and they, they got stretches and they, and they got them down. Then they started to look for the, for Marianne and Christine. They'd gone around further. They evidently, according to, 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 the, to the Crowthers, they had seen the Zambians on the other side. The girls had seen the Zambians on the side. They waved them. There were more shots. Um, the moon waned at, at half past five in the morning. So you must know, you know, how perilous that was within that inkling of light. You know, um, the danger, and look, the, the river is very, very narrow there. The gorgeous is very, very narrow. Um, so, they, you know, the, the chances of being shot at were, were very, very great. Anyway, um, they found one girl, Christine's body, uh, before first life, but they couldn't, get, they couldn't get her out. They couldn't get her out, and uh, she was dead. One thing that we do know is that the Rhodesian security forces had been put on alert, on very, very high alert. Um, they were standing by. Aircraft were in the air, and there was a threat of intense retaliation should there be any interference with the rescue effort. They managed to get um, Christine's body out, and they, they, so they, got, they, they managed to get her out. Um, the other girl, they never recovered. So we just don't know what happened to her. Uh, we just got no idea. Well, they were obviously know, shot by the Zambians. Uh, they were shot, yeah, she was they were obviously shot by the Zambians as well. Uh, her body would have just might have just slipped into the river, and uh, and disappeared. What was so what was did. interesting. I mean, this this did hit the international press, but um, the the view of the world was that this was that the Rhodesians were somehow to blame. It was Rhodesian aggression, and uh, I remember Kurt Voltaire, the UN Secretary General, actually was visiting Zambia, and he came down to Livingston to tell the world himself that um, this was the fault of the Rhodesians um, and there was no ways that uh, the Zambians were in any way responsible. It was just another shining example of the, the double, double standards that we, that we got so used to. But Mike, um, I wanna move on to another, I know we use this word frequently, but I think it does apply, but another legend of the department, uh, Bruce Austin, who, um, who came along later, and I'm happy to say I, I got to know him a little bit in his twilight years, and uh, I was fascinated by him, but you knew him a lot better. Just, just tell us a bit about, about Bruce. 
I first, yeah, I know, thank you. I first met Bruce um, when I was posted to Carl in, let me just think, 1967. He was the regional warden, Victoria. He was stationed at Zimbabwe Ruins. And I'll just tell you quickly that in those days, Zimbabwe Ruins was actually a national park. It was Zimbabwe Ruins National Park. Uh, so it's a ranger station. And uh, Bruce uh, had his offices in, 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 the, in, the, office, in the park's office complex there. Um, it was a small little station, but Bruce had his office there. And uh, he administered the region from there, which comprised of the Gona Resort. So that would go all the way down to Mabaluta. In those days, Mabaluta was crown land. Tim Braybrook was his warden stationed down there. Um, Tetsi Ops were going in the Chipinda Pools area. There was a game reserve there uh, and a controlled hunting area. So those both came and then crown land in between. Mshindik. National Park, uh, outside Port Victoria or Masringo, uh, closer to Mashaba. That fell under, under his jurisdiction, as I say, as, as did Zimbabwe Ruins National Park. And the fledgling game reserve, Kyle, which was shortly thereafter, after I got there, declared a national park. So that was the area that, that uh, fell under, under Bruce's sort of jurisdiction. Uh, oh, sorry, also, it, uh, Birchinop Bridge area, Dibuli, also came with all part of the low field, came under that area there. So we had a field station in, at Birchinop Bridge. Uh, Charlie Williams was initially stationed there, and thereafter Charlie, uh, Paul Reed went there. Roland Russell was the warden or the ranger in charge of Zimbabwe Ruins, and Tim Braybrook was the warden Kyle. So that was, that was Bruce's area. Now, Bruce loved Kyle. It was one of his babies. He really wanted to develop developed Kyle. He, he was scheduled to move across the lake to Kyle. Um, Dick Clark, who's work supervisor, who he later took to Wanky with him, back to Wanky, uh, was building his house and the new office and regional complex at Kyle. But Bruce's big, big sort of um, big love was, you know, was open spaces and spent a lot of time, he spent a lot of time down in, in the low field. He got to meet the farmers and he was, he, he was, he was highly respected. Bruce, I'll just tell you something just quickly, which you know, we learned about from the Todd's Hotel. He knew, he just said Bruce knew, seemed to know everybody. And Todd's Hotel had a tame giraffe, it got a bit, bit too big to, to have. And uh, so Bruce said, send it up to Carl. Um, which it did do. Um, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, everybody, everybody knew that knew that giraffe. It, it was a female. Became a little bit of an issue, a bit of a problem. But uh, yeah, everybody knew about it. And uh, Jean Juno writes some lovely stories. Written some lovely stories about Jerry the giraffe. Bruce, anyway, that Bruce was Bruce's. Took over, was sent took over Wanky. He was posted from there to Wanky. Yeah, he moved there. But if we just go back, if I just go back a little bit to to, to, to what else Bruce did in, in, in the local before moving back to Wanky, um, the Gang Ranchers Association, it's formed, I think it was in 1973. And it was a fledging organization, it was farmers in the Lowfield, people like Dick Spencer. There were one or two others in the West Nicholson area. There were others in the New Nancy area and the Stileses. Mm -hmm. Buffalo Range, they were big ranchers. They were they they all realized you know the importance of, of wildlife and they were pushing for to have wildlife um privatized. Well, not so much privatized, but to be to become part and part of the of the class as part and parcel of the of their farming operation. They were livestock, they were on their farms, so if you treat them like cattle or whatever to say, it was an asset, it, it was a natural asset, and they wanted to utilize it. Um they were given the the quotas. The quotas were issued. Uh, we had a, a survey unit. Jeremy Anderson was the research officer who was first tasked to 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 do surveys. Uh, Dave Rushworth was another. Tony Ferrer, there one or two others. Look, there was Bruder from um, uh, Mkwesi, um, um, uh, and Paula Ranching was was he he was ranching in uh, game ranching on, on on Crown land in the Mkwesi area. And Bruce was, was a champion of these farmers. I mean, he, Bruce realized the, and he had a lot of vision on the set, realized the value of wildlife uh, to the farmer as an asset. And as I say, these chaps were given cropping rights. 
they were allowed to see to 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 sell game. And I remember speaking to, to Dick Spencer. I, I met him a couple of occasions. I had need to go down and visit his ranch on one or two occasions. And I remember Dick, Dick speaking to me. Now this would have been around about sixty eight, I guess. Um, and just said if it hadn't been for his wildlife, he's been able to crop, to sell the meat, to sell the process, uh, to capture and to sell game. And I know he. He talked about catching zebra, and in those days they used nets. Uh, they didn't have the BOMA system, and he just said, you know, he talked to me about the zebra and how he'd been very, very aware, uh, wary of, of, of their bites. He said, just said, you know, he had uh, one or two of his laborers very, very badly. But, uh, but if he hadn't been able to, 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 to crop and, and to utilize his game and to sell it and, and uh, sell the byproducts, some meat, the skins, he would have actually gone broke. The game paid for the day to day running of the ranch. It was a big ranch in the new nets area. And apart, not only did that, it also paid for the insulation of new water points uh, during the drought period, points that were, were essential, you know, to, to keep mm -hmm. his livestock going. Mm -hmm. And so it financed that. And it grew from there. It grew from there. Um, more and more people became involved. And look, the thing really took off the new legislation, but we can, we'll deal with that later. But Bruce was a champion for that. And we don't know how much time Bruce spent down the lip, but look, he was a very busy man. I didn't see Bruce too often. Uh, he was, you know, he was very stern countenance. You know, he's quite stern countenance, but he was very approachable. Uh, he was, you know, disciplinarian, disciplinarian, but very, very approachable. And he spent a lot of time in the farm areas, and he uh, he had a lot of visitors from people coming up to see him. He would have had the, uh, the ICA meeting with ICAs regularly and stuff like that. So, yeah, Bruce, the real champion. Mike, uh, is there's a story that. about thank that. him for that. There's a story about Richard Alwood losing his horse um, and being too terrified to go and tell him that he'd lost the horse. Oh. I think he tracked it for, I don't know, three or four days. In the, and, it, and it was very cold, I gather. Yeah, uh, when Bruce went back to Wanky, uh, so he never got to Carl and uh, he was transferred back to, to Wanky where um, John Tebbett, uh, for whatever reason it was, he just he asked to, to be relieved of his post as regional warden Wanky. Uh, it was a newly created post. He hadn't been, he'd been there for just over a year, I think, and wanted to go back to Victoria Falls, you know, a park that he really loved and been there for so long. So Bruce went back to, to Wanky uh, as, as regional warden and with him went old discipline. At high, you know, Ted Davis and our high standards, Bruce raised those standards even higher. He was always immaculately turned out and uh, he expected his staff to be exactly the same. And uh, what Bruce did was that he reintroduced the old patrol systems, horses. Um, the mules were a thing of the past. So don donkeys were bought in as pack animals and the chaps were sent out on extended, extended patrols. Um, you know, mules carry probably two or three times the load of a donkey. So whether there were tools or three mules, there were now six donkeys or eight donkeys. So six week patrol, you had a donkey boy. Um, they want to have a better word. Or chap looking after the donkeys, he had a game scouts and a range on horseback. Well, Richard Elwood told me the delightful story that he was on one of these six week patrols way down on the bottom end of the park, uh, edge of Ngamo. And, you know, the horses were, and the livestock were, when they got to their, their camp, camp position midday or around about that time, the, the horses were loosely tethered and uh, allowed to feed. They were watched over by the, the, the herd boy. And uh, anyway, Richard's horse took off. You know, Richard grabbed a rifle. He was clad and grabbed, you know, called for a bit of assistance. And I think as two of them, two others went out with him. You know, he was carrying a rifle and, and off he went. Well, the horse just kept ahead of him. Just kept running, it wouldn't stop. First night came and it was the middle of winter, like May, June, when it was cold. Bitterly cold, and there's Richard, pair of shorts, shirt, no blankets, nothing. Uh, and the horse was just ahead of them. They dug holes in the goose's sand, and you had Kalahari sand, bitterly, bitterly cold. They covered themselves in, um, in leaves, trying to keep warm, shivered all night, didn't, didn't sleep too much. I think, not sure whether Richard was wishing the horse. Uh, to be eaten by lions, and I don't know, but they got up in the morning and off they went again, and the horse just stayed ahead of them. It, for some reason, whatever it was, you know, it just stayed ahead of them, and they tracked it. They spent a second night out. 
I'm not sure what they spent a third. They might have spent a third night. Anyway, they eventually caught the horse. Uh, they were terrified that it was going to get eaten by lions, and they wouldn't uh, wouldn't have dared go back. I mean, Bruce had, had, had you know was very very strict about this. <laughs> Uh, the animals were entrusted to the to the rangers, to the to the safety of the rangers. They are part of assets, um, and they needed to be looked after, looked after properly. And you know, it, it wasn't Richard's fault that, you know, that whether the horse got untethered or what. It didn't. It didn't matter at all. Uh, the, the answer was to get the horse horse back again, and which they caught. And uh, Richard was very relieved to do that. And Richard. <laughs> They settled back to their cab. Now they had to go back where they let the donkeys were. And that took him a bit of time. And Richard rode back, rode some of the distance back, bareback. And he said he was incredibly sore when he got back <laughs> to, his, <laughs> to his camp. Anyway, they rested there for a bit and then, then packed up and then they settled to, to, um, back to main camp. And Richard said, don't ever let me, anybody tell you that a, ho you know, a horse, is, is, a dog is a man's best friend. A horse isn't. You know, if they run away and they, they keep going. They were chaps are terrified. They wouldn't lose. They wouldn't lose an animal. They wouldn't dare lose a horse or animal. And I mean, that's that. That you know, Bruce was revered. He was respected, and uh, by all, oh, by the, by the bushmen, by the, 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 the his, his game scouts, the labourers, and and his, Bruce was revered. The game scouts and the bushmen gave. He he was a linguist of note. He spoke. Uh, Bushman, he learned that in 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 in, in his time in Botswana uh, when he was a Tetsi Tetsi control officer in the Ngami area, uh, near in the Bora River near uh, Maon. He learned to speak Bushman. He was revered. He spoke into Billy fluently as well, and he was given the sort of honor name. Um, I was trying to think what his honor name was. Uh, All right, just tell us a bit more. Basically, about the one who follows. Tell us a bit more about the Bushmen. There were some, there were some fairly prominent Bushmen that emerged, and they and they were absolutely um, essential uh, in the, the development of the park. Were they not? Oh, they were. Yes. Um, I was back to remember Bruce's name was Malundela, the one who follows. Bruce knew everything, uh, but that he was revered. But to go to the Bushmen, um, oh, they, they, I only knew of one. That was Japanet. Um, when he was Japani, who was at um, Atetsi when I was stationed there, Billy Howells worked with him. Just said he was a phenomenal tracker as well. But he said, you know, the, those years that um, I was there after, after Bruce, Japan was getting old and, and his eyes were fading. But I mean, Billy just, just said he was legendary. He never failed. He just took you, he led you to where he had to go. And the same with the, with the, with the Bushman there was Sumbi, Joyce who ended up in the Binga area and then moved around the countryside with Bobby Thompson. There was uh, Joel, Joel, who Tim Braybrook used regularly. He was a, uh, a hunter of note, a very, very skilled hunter, particularly good, you know, uh, on lion. And Tim used to send him out lion control work. He was issued with a, a Martini Henry, that, oh, that uh, focus and action rifle. 450, 577 caliber, everything, but pretty slow. And uh, he was sent out on that. And I mean, Tim, Tim reports of that uh, one, on the one incident where I think it was Broomberg from the Guai Hotel, who also had a ranch, was, was losing cattle and uh, Joel was sent out there and he tracked the line all over the show. And anyway, to cut a long story short, Harry Brumberg uh, got hold of, of, of Tim and said, you've got to come out and help us. Well, so they went out and they, they teamed, Tim teamed up with Joel and, and other game scouts. I think Japan might have been another one who said he was at the time there, Japan, he was there. And uh, they set off after this line. And Tim reports, he just said, it was the most phenomenal bit of tracking that he has ever seen uh, through broken country, virtually invisible tracks. And Joel stayed on these tracks broken ground to thick, thick scrub, close to the dead clay, the, the densest of dense scrub. And he tracked them, brought them right up to the line that was a seep. And uh, Tim just said, well, yeah. Jo uh, Joel and him, oh, they, they finished it off. That, that was the thing. And uh, then there was another one, Ron used. And uh, 
I, I, I was I, I accompanied Ron on a few hunts with Ben down in the local Nagana Resort on a problem animal, or whatever it was. And uh, Ben is another Masili Bushman, and uh, he, he was also made up to a game scout. Ben had that he used to smoke a pipe when he was out in the bush, and you know. He used to walk along ahead of us, he was tracking, tracking buffalo or whatever it was, or elephant. And Ben used to stoke and puff away at his pipe, just keep going. And I must admit, it, it actually, it fascinated me this, and uh, I, I, just, I just wondered, you know. So one day I actually asked on, it was, it was after a hunt where he got said, why? You know, why, why does Ben smoke when he, when he you know, when we, when we track him? Surely, you know, it, it's not. And Ron, you know, I just said, um, I asked Ron, I said, you know, been smoking a pipe and you know, he just said, uh, have you noticed that you know Ben when Ben puts his pipe in, in his pocket or stops smoking it and just holds it, uh, you're close to, to, to animals. Well uh, believe me, you know, that, was, that, that I had noticed that and uh, but Ben this you know was his own and Bushman loved tobacco smoking and Ben was just this, you know just a normal one. And when he put his pipe away, put it just put it out put it in his pocket, you knew you were close. And five, 10 minutes, you were, you were there, you made contact with whatever it was. And I mean, that, that's, I mean, he never failed. Ron used him extensively in the early capture opera, rhino capture operations in the Binga area going in the, in the early 60s after Rupert Fothergill had been injured. He used him, uh, he used Ben uh, when they did the big capture operations, rhino capture operations in the, in the Northeast. He, they caught the two rhino out of the Chipangai area uh, in the Chipinga area. The last two that were left, Ben tracked down and they caught those. Um, so yeah, he was phenomenal. And then there's the other one, I think, I'm Joyce, that uh, Bobby Thompson sort of inherited from Ron and he was a Chisarira. And uh, another, another, another legend, another, another man, as Bobby Thompson said, Born probably never to wear clothes, but he, you know, he had to wear them. And but a phenomenal hunter and an incredible naturalist. Bobby used to send him out in the remote areas of Chisarira and uh, on elephant control. He sent him out by bicycle, four, five, eight, bunch of rounds of belt, belt ammunition, which we normally carried for control work. And then when they were in the area later on, they'd recover the tusks. There was no problem in those days. There was a, the, 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 everybody was honest. The, the villages where surrounding where the elephant was put down would recover the tusks. They would take him to the to the headman or the chief, and we used to go and pick these up. You know, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, maybe two or three months later. When in the area, we'd go and get them. And you know, um, Joel used to do this. There's a delightful story I told about Joel, um, which nobody's ever been able to substantiate. In his early days in the department, uh, when he was on patrol. He joined, I think, in the early 50s. And he was a herd boy for Ted Davidson. And we had, they had a herd of cattle in, in the main camp area. They were a uh, herd that had been kept there so they could monitor the presence of Tetsi fly uh, because the fly corridors were later opened up across the way. Um, but he was initially the herd boy, and, he, and okay, then he became tracker and a game scout. And the story goes that whilst on patrol in, in the uh, bottom end of the park, probably in the, in the, uh, in the Makona area, he slipped across into Botswana to visit his, his house and his family. And he found his wife in the arms of, a, of another. Well, he shot, he's reported to have shot the, shot the lover, come back again, and continue with his, with his, with his patrol. Uh, Bobby told me about it and he just said, you know, he, he asked from Joyce about it. Sorry, uh, Joyce about it, yes. And uh, he just had a sort of, Joyce just had a rude smile on his face and uh, didn't comment any further. So there's probably, it's probably substantial. You just understand that he never went back to Botswana again and stayed, stayed in, in, in <laughs> Zimbabwe. Mm. Um, so those, those are the Bushmen. Bobby uh, promoted him to sergeant to increase his pension funds and stuff like that. The, the chaps were very, very conscious of the needs of the, of the, of the, of the game scouts, of their trackers. Mm. Uh, we worked as a, as, a, as a team, and this is what people have got to understand. We were just a team, the game scouts, the trackers, uh, the rangers, wardens, which we were all a team. There was a great deal of respect for each other. Um, and this is what built the department. This is what actually built the department. And as the department grew, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, 
you know, when the departments were amalgamated, that is the Wildlife Conservation Department and uh, National Parks to, to form the department that we knew and got to love, uh, National Parks, Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management. Uh, we will learn more there of the, of the, of the, you know, the camaraderie and the respect for each, each, each other. We had a remarkable team the men, women, the wives, everybody, the, the just a great, great team. So Johannes, yeah. So that um, Thanks, I think sort of tells us sort of the early days. Yeah. And I think we, we end it there, Mike. Um, but uh, for now, uh, I think great start and some, some fascinating material. Oh, well, Hannes, I hope, I hope the, you know, the sort of the viewers find it interesting. And as I say, the, it's, it's, there's, a great, there's a great story to tell. There's a tremendous story to tell. And uh, we've got some legend, legendary characters. There's the Clem um, Yeah. There's Ron Thompson. There's, there's, there's Terry Finn. There's some remarkable characters. And uh, now we learn about what these chaps did, the dedication, team, teamwork that, that just built up the department into, into say, a legend, absolutely legendary, and probably the finest, what well, it was without a doubt, the finest department in Africa and a conservation agency in, in Africa. And that's, that's not, I'm not saying that lightly, and it was probably one of the finest conservation agency, or probably the finest conservation agency in the world. What we did with nothing, well, the chaps did with very little, is, you know, it's got to be, got to be seen to be believed. And so we would, I think we'll go back to that later, maybe. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of others who can talk and uh, tell their stories and tell of, you know, of those that have gone, there's Willie De Beer, there's a whole heap of chaps to talk about. We'll come to them. Thanks, Mike. Hannes, thanks very much indeed. And yeah, I, um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and bringing this program into being. Have a good evening and thanks so much. Cheers, Mike.